Time to begin our class this morning. Good to have everybody here. We are studying, um, still studying, uh, lesson 23 in our workbook on men and women of the Bible, Joseph. And we had gotten through, uh, let's say, at least a third of Joseph's story last Sunday. So we're going to continue on that today, and then uh, Wednesday evening, uh, we'll do the questions on the outline there. You have your uh, workbook that Brother Asher's put together on the subject of Joseph. <clears throat> I think we've gotten to the point where Joseph has been uh, sold into slavery, if you will, into Egypt in the house of Potiphar by the Ishmaelite tradesman that picked him up at Dothan or Shechem, I guess it really was, as they were um, heading on their trade route down to Egypt. And uh, Joseph now finds himself in Potiphar's uh, service. And we'll take up there this morning and then continue on through the story of Joseph, which, uh, if you've noticed, the entire remaining chapters in the book of Genesis are devoted to Joseph. <laughs> And Joseph's story. Um, if we if we start in chapter thirty seven, uh, where we talk about Joseph's dreams, when he was seventeen years old, through the fiftieth chapter of Genesis, all has to do with Joseph and his encounters with Pharaoh and the famine that plagued Egypt and the world at that time, and then Jacob's family coming to Egypt for grain, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> the encounters that Joseph had with him, his final revelation of himself to his brethren, and then bringing Jacob and the rest of the family and all of Jacob's possessions down into Egypt and settling them into the land of Goshen. And what, what would be the significance of Jacob and his family all coming to Egypt as far as Israel's future history is concerned? Uh, approximately, or maybe a little longer than that, actually. Uh, I don't know, if, when you stop and think about it, God has used heathen nations to protect his people, sometimes against their will, that his plan for man might be carried out. Israel was over 400 years in Egyptian bondage. And then when we get a little further into Jewish history, the times of the kings of Israel. Israel rejected God as their king, demanded to be like the, the uh, nations about them. And um, with the um, departure of Rehoboam from following after God, and God says, this is it. The kingdom's going to be divided and eventually the northern kingdom lost in Assyrian captivity. But when you read further into the kings of Judah, many of the people that were dispersed from Assyrian captivity, many of the Jews remained in the northern kingdom because some of them came back to Jerusalem to worship occasionally. Uh, but God used the Babylonians, the major power at that time, to preserve Judah for 70 years until they finally bring them back to Palestine. And you might even look um, even further down the line and make an argument that he used Rome to preserve Judah uh, in uh, relative peace and an orderly fashion, as Paul puts it in the fourth chapter of Galatians, in the, in the, the proper time, when the time was right, God brought forth his son. He brought Jesus into the world as the world was at peace under the rulership of Rome. So God has used heathen nations to preserve his people throughout history. And we'll find that God had communications with heathens all throughout his history. And we'll have some examples of that in today's lesson. Okay. So before we begin, Greg, would you lead us in prayer? Uh, 
All right, man. Let's so uh, just by way of review, um, we'll look at Jacob's family tree up here. And of course, we're talking about Joseph over here on the far right, child number 11, born to Rachel, the younger sister of Leah. And you'll remember that Leah had uh, six sons by Jacob and one daughter. These were the, the older children in the family. Uh, Leah's handmaid, Zilpah, had Gad and Asher by Jacob, and Bilhah, who was Rachel's handmaid, had Dan and Naphtali by Jacob. Rachel, remember, uh, bore Joseph and Benjamin, and Joseph, as we read in the 37th chapter of of Genesis was Jacob's favorite son. For what reason? Okay. He was a son of his old age. Of course, Benjamin was also, but Joseph was the firstborn. And he actually was the firstborn of which wife of Jacob? And don't just say Rachel. His, his favorite. That's right. <clears throat> So we had the story, we've already talked about Joseph working seven years and, and Laban implying that after those seven years he would give Rachel as his wife, but of course then made the excuse, well, in a, where we come from, we don't give the youngest daughter before the older in marriage. And so Leah became the first wife, but immediately afterwards, Rachel became his wife, but then he had to work another seven years uh, for that. And we've had the story of the, their division, and we're not going to get into that this morning. But when we come back to the story of Joseph here in the 37th chapter of Genesis, somebody bring us kind of up to date on how Joseph wound up in Egypt to begin with. What prompted his being sold to the Ishmaelite tradesmen? Okay. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> he had two dreams that he told his father and his brothers. What was the first one? Yeah, we're out harvesting, and here I had a sh I garnered a sheaf of of uh, grain, and you guys had each one of yours, and what happened? Yeah, the the sheaves of the brothers bowed down to Joseph. Uh, and then what was the second dream? Yeah. Who interpreted those two dreams? <laughs> yeah, you find that interesting? Joseph didn't interpret those dreams, did he? He told the dreams. These were Joseph's dreams. But to his brothers and his father, the interpretation was obvious, <laughs> okay? And so, of course, his brothers hated him uh, for that. But the other reason was that was the other reason. What did, the, what did Joseph's father give Joseph? The coat of many colors or many pieces or many stripes. It's translated differently in different translations. But it was a very colorful coat. We talked about that. It was a, a tunic that was commonly given to young men before they became of age. Um, 
And in Roman times, after a, a young man turned like 17 or 14, I forget what it was, they were given a white tunic to wear. But before that, they were given a colored tunic, maybe something similar to this. But anyway, they were jealous of him. They hated him. And so the, the mood was right to, to dispose of him. So he set to um, check on his uh, brothers. And as Ron pointed out, uh, they wanted to kill him. Who was the brother that was coming to Joseph's rescue? Reuben. Where did he fall in the order of children of Jacob? He was the oldest. Reuben was the firstborn. And he had planned to so put him in this pit, which is probably a dry well or cistern or something like that. And uh, he was going to come back and fetch him out of there and take him back to his father. But in the meantime, while apparently Reuben is away, these Midianite or Ishmaelite tradesmen come by and they sell him for how much? 20 pieces of silver. How much was Jesus betrayed for? 30 pieces of silver. Okay. All right. So as we move on to uh, in the story of Joseph, we come to the 30 ninth chapter of Genesis. How do things go in Potiphar's household for Joseph? And how does it go for Potiphar's household in general? It was successful. Pardon? It was, he was successful in his household. Was successful. Okay. Because of Joseph's presence in his household, Potiphar's household is, is blessed to the point where what does Potiphar how does he elevate Joseph? Gives him control of everything in the house except for his wife. Yeah. Look at verse 6. He left all in Joseph's hands. He knew not aught that he had save the bread which he did eat. So he turned everything, the financial matters, the running of the household, everything. Joseph was in charge. And to the extent that Potiphar didn't know what he had. <laughs> all he knew was he was captain of Pharaoh's guard. He could concentrate on taking care of Pharaoh's business, but as far as his personal business at home, that was he totally entrusted that to Joseph. And so as a result of Joseph's position in his household and probably also his handsome appearance, what resulted? Yes. And was Joseph responsive to her <laughs> beck and call? No, no. In fact, he, if you'll notice verse 9, I think this is a good good verse for us to all, all remember. Um, he said, there's nothing greater in this house, there is none greater in this house than I. I mean, I'm in charge. He's kept back, that is, Potiphar has kept back nothing from me, but you, his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say I'm a sin against Potiphar or sin against you, but I'm sinning against God if I accept this um, seduction or however you want to describe it that, that Potiphar's wife is suggesting. And so, but that didn't, that didn't stop her. She, she still... Uh, came after him one day when there were no other uh, persons in the household to be witnesses. And, of course, he runs, runs out of the room, leaves his coat, and then she makes up this story about how he tried to attack her and so on and so forth. And, of course, Potiphar's enraged. And we brought this up last week. Do you think Potiphar really knew his wife very well? That's right. That is a good point. I hadn't really thought about that. But you, you wonder, has Potiphar's wife tried something like this before? <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, and the only reason I bring that up is how much trust did Potiphar apparently, according to the text, have in Joseph? <laughs> 
total, unwavering. I mean, he trusted trust him with all of his physical possessions, running of his household, and so on and so forth. And yet, you know, this story about Joseph trying to seduce his wife, uh, you got to think in the back of Potiphar's mind there was some question mark, but to keep peace at home perhaps and to make things look proper, uh, he had Joseph put in the... Uh, put in prison. So in the verse 20 of chapter 39, it says, Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison, which would suggest to me this wasn't the prison where the vilest criminals were thrown. When Paul was put in prison, what prison was he, he and Silas thrown into? How's it described in the text? I think it's called the inner prison. So it's the, it's the dungeon where the worst of the worst were kept. But that doesn't seem to be the case with Joseph because it says in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy. And Joseph was such a pristine prisoner in prison. Uh, what did the keeper of the prison do with him. <laughs> he's in charge of all the prisoners. So at Potiphar's house, he's in charge of all of Potiphar's household. In prison, he's in charge of all the, all the prisoners. And it says, the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, just like Potiphar. Potiphar knew nothing about what was going on in his household. He trusted Joseph to that. The keeper of the prison didn't know what was going on in the prison. Joseph was in charge of that. He might as well have been the keeper of the prison. And he says, the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made to prosper. So the, God is with Joseph in everything that he does while he's here in, in Egypt. So that brings us up to, uh, we're getting close to where we left off last week. Any thoughts or comments on anything we've talked about so far? Anybody? Feel free to speak up. If you got a question or something you'd like to add, Greg? I'm sorry. Well, right, coat. It may be translated tunic or something like that. It was a, it was an outer garment of some kind, something that would be obvious to people because it would be worn. Um, where everyone could could see see what it was. All right, so in prison he runs into two of Pharaoh's servants who have been tossed into jail for some reason or another. Who were they? The butler or the baker. And they both had dreams while they were in prison. Why do you suppose they had dreams? You think these were just random dreams that they had? Everyone's head should be going horizontally, back and forth, not vertically, right? Who caused them to have these dreams? God did. I mean, it doesn't say explicitly in the text, but it's obvious from the outcome. These are, these are prophetic dreams. Uh, things that are about to take place that would give Joseph a toehold into Pharaoh's household if the butler would remember to tell Pharaoh about Joseph. <laughs> That's the only limiting factor is the butler. So anyway, they both have dreams, and what, what's, what are their dreams and what's the outcome? What did the butler dream? Mm -hmm. How many branches did the vine have? Three. Okay. And so Joseph is 
says, what? What does that mean? Okay, it means the three branches are three days, and in three three days you'll be restored to your position uh, as a, a butler. So, you know, it's back in verse 8, something we might ought to notice in chapter 40. Uh, they said, we've had this dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them, tell me them, I pray you. Uh, Joseph, I think, knew God was with him. And Joseph is not going to be the one who's going to be taking credit for any of these interpretations, but he's going to tell the people that he's for whom he's interpreting the dreams that it's God who's doing this. And so the baker, he has a dream. What did he dream? Yeah, the birds ate all of his baked goods. And so what did Joseph say that meant? That in three days that the Pharaoh will execute him. Yeah. He's, he's going to, uh, sounds like he's going to behead him and then hang his body out for the birds to eat. And as the chapter ends, chapter 40, that's exactly what happens. And yet, uh, verse 23, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. So that's going to be the limiting factor of Joseph getting out of prison, which brings up another point. Joseph was 17 years old when he headed to Dothan to find his brothers. When he was made governor of Egypt, how old do we say he was? Thirty. So thirteen years are transpiring from the time he goes looking for his brothers and he's thrown into a pit and sold into slavery till he becomes second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt. Thir only thirteen years. Very short period of time. Two of those years, he was in prison, forgotten by the butler. We don't know how long he served in Potiphar's household before he was put in prison, nor do we know totally how long he was in prison. But he was in prison at least two years. And so the reason he gets out of prison is what? Yes, Pharaoh now has a dream. You think these were random dreams that Pharaoh had one night? Had some spicy food for supper and had indigestion and caused him to have a crazy dream? No, God gave him the dream. Joseph even tells Pharaoh, God is prophesying through your dreams. He's telling you what is going to happen to Egypt over the next 14 years when he finally interprets the dreams. But anyway, make a long story short, uh, Pharaoh has this dream, and what was the dream that he had this First dream. And what did the skinny cows look like after they ate the fat cows? Skinny as they were before. Okay. So like all rulers in this age, um, like Nebuchadnezzar did, so is doing Pharaoh. What does Pharaoh, where does he look for help in interpreting his dream? Verse 8 of chapter 41. Magicians. All, yeah, all the magicians of Egypt, all the wise men. You know. But there was none that can interpret them to Pharaoh. Now, could they have made up something? I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure they could have. Maybe they've made up interpretations for him in the past. Who knows? But not this time. And then verse 9, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. 
So two years after having his dream interpreted and his being restored to his place in uh, Egypt, it took an event like this for him to remember what Joseph had asked of him. I mean, he Joseph kind of gives a little speech to the the butler back in verse uh, or in chapter forty. Verse 14 says, But think on me when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I pray you, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed, I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have, not, I have done nothing that they should put me into prison. Okay. How often do we sometimes forget things? <laughs> we forget things a lot, don't we? We forget obligations. We forget to do things that we, we know we should do. And sometimes it takes uh, a significant event to kind of jog our memories about things. And so this jogged the butler's memory. And he... Uh, Tells Pharaoh, says Pharaoh was upset with his servants and he put me in the ward and the captain of the guard and put me and the chief baker and this Hebrew, we had these dreams and this Hebrew interpreted our dreams and here I am back serving you again and, and the baker was executed as, as, uh, as, as this Hebrew had, had said he would be. So Pharaoh called for Joseph. Now look at verse 14 just a minute. <clears throat> Somebody read verse 14 of chapter 41. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came to Pharaoh. All right. Keep that spot marked and turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And someone read uh, verse 20 for us, 2 Samuel 12. So David broke from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went into his own house, and when he requested to set food before him, he ate. Okay, that's after the death of the child born to him and his illicit relationship with Bathsheba. What's common amongst those two events? Joseph and David. Up. Yeah. Why did Joseph clean himself up? No, Joseph. Who's he going to go see? Pharaoh. What, what kind of condition has David been in? Sackcloth and ashes. Who's he going to go see? God. What's the lesson to be learned from that, if any? <laughs> yes. When Joseph was going to go see Pharaoh, that was something important. He was clean. he cleaned himself up, shaved himself, changed his clothes, and came into his presence. When jo when David was going to go worship God, he was going to give God his best. He was going to clean up. He's not in mourning anymore. He's cleaning up and going to worship God. So I think that's something significant just to keep in mind in those situations. So when he goes to see Pharaoh, Pharaoh tells Joseph, I've had this dream, no one can interpret it. And what does Joseph say in verse 16? Yeah. And all these instances, 
Joseph is giving God the credit. I'm not, I'm just a, a vehicle. I'm just a spokesperson. God is the one who is, is doing all this and who will give Pharaoh the answer. He will give God, Pharaoh an answer of peace. Okay? And so he tells Joseph the same dream again the, about the cattle. And then... He woke up, and then he has another dream. And what was the second dream? Seven plump ears and seven thin ears. Okay, and what about them? Okay. Yeah, it's kind of unclear whether these were two segments of the of the same dream or on two separate nights he dreamed these two things. But anyway, in the second dream, he had this the seven thin ears of grain and the and the seven full ears of grain and the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. Um and that was the end of the dream. These magicians, they couldn't tell me that dream either. Uh, and verse 25 is what I was referring to earlier. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So Joseph's telling Pharaoh, God has spoken to you in a dream. Has God spoken to some of his servants? I say servants, Jewish servants in dreams. Absolutely. And so he's speaking to Pharaoh through this dream, and it's Joseph who God is using to interpret this dream to tell Pharaoh what's about to happen. So what's about to happen? What do these dreams mean? Okay. And... Look at verse 32. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. So you've, you've had two dreams. They're both about the same thing, but the reason you've had, them, had it twice is because God is it's from God and he's assuring you that this is actually going to happen. This wasn't just a fly-by-night dream. You know, you have crazy dreams, and well, it'll never happen, and so on and so forth. No, this is a dream. The same consequences of the dream happened twice to reassure Pharaoh that this is actually going to happen. <coughs> so what's Pharaoh's reaction to this interpretation? Oh well, before I should go, I should say, what is Joseph? What is Joseph's advice to Pharaoh after he interprets the dream? To do what? Okay, and you notice uh, he says. Um, somebody read verse 33 in something other than the King James. Okay, what's verse 33 say? Read the next one. Now let Pharaoh look for a man wise, discerning, and set him over the land of Egypt. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I've got a footnote in my Bible on that. It says discreet and wise in the King James. It's. Uh, 
uh, footnote is cautious. What is the what is human nature when some sort of calamity is about to happen? As far as taking care of oneself. What happens when a Category 5 hurricane is predicted to hit South Florida? What do you see in all the publics and Walmarts and so forth? Is everyone thinking of his neighbor necessarily in those situations? <laughs> no, they're going to make sure their cupboard's full and they're ready for the hurricane, right? So when Pharaoh appoints someone head over the, the saving of grain for a seven years of famine, what kind of a person do you have to have overseeing the collection of this grain and later its distribution? Absolutely. Someone who is wise, who's fair, who makes sure everyone is taken care of, that no one is hoarding and taking what belongs to someone else should get and that sort of thing. So fairness is um, an integrity and so forth. They're all qualities that this person that Pharaoh chooses is going to have. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So anyway, in, um, uh, in the King James, it talks about corn. And I think probably in your newer translation, it does say grain, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not corn like what we grow, uh, but it's grain, probably wheat or something of that nature um, that they were storing. So who does payroll pick and why? Absolutely. Verse 39 says, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, For as much as God has shown you these things, there is none so discreet and wise as you are. You shall be over my house according to uh, your word, shall my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. Okay? So, uh, Pharaoh places Joseph in charge of, of the, the grain. He gives Joseph a, a new name in verse 45, Japheth Paania, Zaphnath Paania, which I've got a footnote in my Bible means the one to whom secrets are revealed. And he gives him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest or prince of On, to be his wife. And she is going to be the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim. So Manasseh and Ephraim over here, Joseph's two sons, which will be, which will be two of the tribes of Israel that will have land promises, are half Egyptian. Okay? Uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim will later be sort of um, synonymous with Israel or the northern kingdom, which of course was carried away into Assyrian captivity. But this um, wife of Joseph is from Heliopolis, which is a city kind of in southern in the southern Nile Delta area of Egypt, one of the oldest cities in uh, Egypt. Uh, it, it was there that an obelisk to the sun god was erected, which is still standing today in its original spot. Um, 
and uh, it's uh, 69 feet tall, I think. It says it's made out of red granite, and it's the oldest obelisk in the world that's still standing in its original position. And uh, it's said that when the Washington Monument was designed, uh, e uh, Egyptology was very popular in 18th and 19th century America, and the architect who designed the monument to George Washington patterned it after an Egyptian obelisk. So if you look up the obelisk at, I forget the name of it, uh, in Heliopolis, um, and look at the picture of it, it looks like the Washington Monument, except it's got carvings on the outside of it. Now something I didn't know, <laughs> The Washington Monument is not a true obelisk. You know why that is? Somebody might know. Well, uh, the Washington Monument's made out of Indiana limestone. That's not why it's not an obelisk, <laughs> in the true sense of the word. But it's got three different, it was the, the, the stone for the Washington Monument was mined from three different quarries. That's why when you get about two thirds of the way up, the color of the stone changes. There's different color stones up because there was a hiatus in its construction of about, I don't know, 20 years because uh, Congress didn't have the money to finish it. <laughs> it was a basic reason. But an obelisk, a true obelisk is one piece of stone. Washington Monument is made out of many pieces of limestone cemented together. So it's shaped like an obelisk. It looks like an obelisk, but it's not a true obelisk. So this thing in Egypt is a solid piece of red granite, 69 feet tall, I think. It's pretty impressive looking. You see a picture of it. So anyway, that's where Joseph's wife was from, and her father was the prince of On, or Heliopolis, or something like that. So she was kind of a upper class royalty type person uh, that was given to Joseph to be his wife. Okay. So anyway, uh, we progress on through the story. The, the years of uh, famine hit and not only affects Egypt, but where else is affected by the famine? Yeah, where Joseph's family was in Palestine was affected as well. And so Jacob sends his sons to Egypt, and they, of course, have to come before Joseph. And you turn to the 42nd chapter of Genesis as Joseph's brothers come to buy grain from him. Did Joseph receive them warmly? No. What do you accuse them of being? Yeah. You, you've just come out to spy out to see how weak Egypt is, and you're going to carry it back to some other country, and they're going to try to attack us or take us over or something during this time of, of weakness. And so to make a long story short, he gives even grain, but um, who's held hostage? So you can guarantee that they'll come back. <laughs> well, Benjamin hasn't come down yet because Joseph or Jacob wouldn't let him come because he's afraid he'd lose him. Simeon. Simeon's left as a pledge. And so the, he says, he asks him if he have another brother. Yes, we have a younger brother, but our father wouldn't let him come because he's already lost one son. He didn't want to lose uh, Benjamin. So he says, well, you, you need to bring him back. And another thing that Joseph did to complicate his brother's problem was what? Relative to the money that Jacob had sent down to pay for the grain. He put it in their grain sack. In their grain sack. And so anyway, they get back, and here's all this money, and, and of course, they eat up the food that, the, that they brought back, and they have to go down the second time. And this time, you know, the, the brothers convince Jacob to allow Benjamin uh, 
to go down. So how did uh, Joseph make himself known to his brothers on that second trip as they come down the second trip? Yeah, he made a big feast for them, and they, they said, they're going to have lunch with me today. It wasn't lunch, but they're going to have a meal with me today. And so um, he said, chapter 45, he couldn't refrain himself any longer. And so he told his brothers that, you know, I'm Joseph, your brother. You sold me into Egypt. He said, but don't be grieved or angry, verse 5, for yourselves that you sold me. For God did send me before you to preserve life. So God has used heathen nations and heathen rulers to carry out his plan. He has used unfaithful brethren to carry out his plans. He has used faithful servants to carry out his plans. <laughs> it kind of shows that God's in charge, doesn't it? Uh, we sometimes get the idea when we read the Bible that the rest of the world is in a vacuum and God didn't have any interaction with any of these other people. When God commanded jo Jonah to, to go preach to the city of Nineveh, what did Jonah do? <laughs> Why? Why wouldn't a good Jewish boy like Jonah go preach to the people in Nineveh? Well, they were heathens. Of course they were. They're, they're not worthy to hear God's word, right? Well, the real reason he, was, he didn't want to preach to them, what was he afraid might happen if he did go preach to them? They might repent. Oh, my goodness. We can't, we can't have that. Can Christians today have that same attitude, sadly? Why do we not take the gospel to every creature? We sometimes think, well, they're not worthy of the gospel, or they're too, they're too evil to receive the gospel, or God doesn't want people like that in the church. <laughs> no, the gospel is for all, right? I think we sang a song with that title. And so we've got to take the gospel to everyone. The gospel is for, for the good, the bad, and the ugly. There, it's for, the gospel is for everyone. And God has had that attitude throughout all history. And he's used these people to carry out uh, his plan. And as Joseph it makes himself known to his brethren, they're reunited. He has Jacob, his father, brought into Egypt. And they're given the choice lands in Goshen uh, because they have flocks and herds. Uh, and they need the grazing land for, the, for their cattle and so forth. And so um, the family now is in Egypt. And if you turn to chapter 47, verse 28, it says, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 150 and seven years. And it came time for he must die, and he you know, gives blessings to his children. And, of course, we, I think we've talked about this before, that Jacob placed a blessing on uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, but uh, he, didn't, he did not put, it was kind of like uh, Jacob and Esau, he didn't put the blessing on the oldest, he put the blessing on the youngest that the older would serve the younger. And that kind of upset Joseph. Uh, but Jacob says, no, this is the way it's, it's going to be. And of course, uh, Manasseh was inferior to uh, Ephraim in that sense. So the only thing that Joseph asked of his, uh, his uh, brethren, his descendants, is when I die, and he died at age 110, verse 26 of Genesis chapter 50, uh, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt, but he said, said there's going to be a day when the children of Israel are going to be returned to the promised land, and I want my bones taken and buried in Palestine, just as he had buried his father in Palestine, he was going to be buried in Palestine, and when Moses led 
the children of Israel out of Egypt. The text says they took the bones of Joseph with them, and he was interred there in uh, Palestine when they reached the promised land. So anyway, uh, that ends our class. Time's up. And so uh, look at those questions on Joseph and uh, who, who's got, Albert's got the class Wednesday night and he'll go over those at that time. Okay, thanks.